Hello, this is Dr. Fala. This module I want to talk about statistical analysis. I will briefly talk about basic or descriptive statistics, the use of distribution and histogram, what's normal distribution and its application in statistical analysis, use of z-score tables, and then briefly talk about control chart for variables. Okay, so what is a statistics? In definition, a statistics is a science of collection, organization, and interpretation of the data. Or as it's defined here, statistics, in short, is the st study of data. Okay, uh, there are two types of statistics. If you use the entire population, refer to statistics of a population, then the size of the population is shown by capital N, it's mean by mu, and standard deviation by sigma. But oftentimes we refer to the population through a sample of data we call inferential statistics. In that case, when we're using the sample, the size of the sample is shown by a small n, the mean value is shown by x bar and the standard deviation by s. So why do we use inferential statistics? Because using the population often creates some difficulties. Our population could be too large to collect all the data. Uh, it could be also impractical to handle. Let's think about if you want to collect data on voting record of the entire population of the United States, that's not an easy task to do. So most uh, people that collect data, they use a sample for that purpose. It's also too costly to go after a large sample or the entire population. It's time consuming. And also a statistician have shown that we can get good result within a reasonable confidence using a sample instead of trying to collect data on the entire population. So what are these descriptive statistics? Descriptive statistics or summary statistics are measurements that describe the data set, either the population or the sample. Uh, it could have a mean, minimum value, it could, the data could have a maximum value, a mean, mode, and median. Mean, mode, and median are normally referred to as measure of central tendency of the data. Then we also have range, a variance, and a standard deviation, and those are measure of dispersion of the data, how data are different from each other and, uh, and separate from uh, in their values. The standard deviation of a population, again, if you are using a, a population, we collect individual data samples, and then you have individual data samples minus the mean value, you square that, divided by the total sam uh, population size, and the square root of that will be the standard deviation of the population. The same formula also applies for a sample, except that in this case we use the Instead of the mean value of the population, we use the uh, sample mean. And then for uh, the n that we use in the population, we use the small n minus 1, we're subtracting 1 from that for uh, degree of uh, the, for, for, for the degree of freedom. And that's how the statistics are collected. But if you notice, if the sample is very large, the n minus 1 does not really make any difference in the calculation of the standard uh, deviation of the mean. Okay, now what is a distribution? Distribution is a picture of the variability and the central tendency of the data. So if you think about the observations that are measured on, on some uh, scales at the on the x-axis here, the more of the same uh, value we observe and, and we plot them, we can get a picture where most of the variation, most of the data falls in, in this category and a few of them uh, toward the left end and some toward the right end. And this picture we'll talk about 
as the distribution of the data. And so if you were collecting data, as we have seen in other uh, part of the course, you collect the uh, samples and then you create buckets. And this is how we create a histogram, is a display of that distribution of observation by their frequency. So we have got buckets of, uh, of values and then we look at how many of the sample data falls within each bucket and uh, that frequency is shown on the y-axis. And then uh, we create, and that's become the uh, uh, picture of the distribution of the sample. And we'll look at to see how does this shape uh, look like? And does it represent any functional form that we could use? And uh, if not, uh, then we can just use the, the sample distribution as is for uh, calculating some uh, statistical values that we uh, may be interested in. However, if the sample can show a symmetrical distribution similar to this, you know, trying to fit a normal curve. Normal curve is a distribution that is symmetrical uh, around the mean. And if we could do that, and uh, this is, if you think about it, it's not really filling exactly uh, the shape of, of this curve. But to the, to the extent that we can approximate it as a good uh, fit, then we can use the attribute and properties of the normal distribution in our statistical analysis and that will help a great deal in terms of ability to answer uh, the questions about confidence and other uh, uh, statistics uh, of value that we might be interested in. And so normal distribution is, is really very useful to to have now, if it doesn't fit a normal distribution and it has fit a different kind of a curve, we have a, a whole series of distribution function that one can use. So I talk about normal distribution. The, so normal distribution is a unimodal, means that there is one uh, single high point in the distribution. It's a bell shape. Uh, Many uh, phenomena in the nature actually follows a normal distribution, uh, and normal distribution has a has a nice statistical properties as we showed before. In this case, the mean of the distribution is the same as the median, and is the same as the as the mode of the distribution. However, the functional form of a normal distribution is actually pretty uh, complex. Uh, this is the functional form that if you want to look at every data point on, on this curve, then you can put the value of, of x uh, into this functional form and find out what the y is, which will be the height of this curve. And this is uh, probably very discouraging for people who want to use it. And these are some properties of that. Uh, but because normal has a has a has a lot of uh, uh, interesting and useful uh, properties. For example, uh, in a normal distribution, 68% um, of the observations fall within one standard deviation on each side of the mean. 34.13 uh, on this side, 34.13 on this side. If you go to this standard deviation to each on the each side of the mean, we're getting 95% uh, of the observation. And uh, when we go to three standard deviation, which we'll talk about as being um, the limit for, for control limits for uh, for the control chart, that covers 99.7% uh, uh, of the uh, of the sample observation or the uh, distribution uh, of that function. So that's uh, that's pretty uh, nice in that uh, sense that we can refer to these values very easily and uh, and, and draw observations uh, from them. So um, a standard normal now all normal distribution have that bell shape uh, symmetrical curve and the uh, the function is on the x value and uh, the observations goes uh, along the. Uh, the distribution curve. However, there is one unique version of that that we call a standard normal. That's a normal distribution that has a mean value of zero and a standard deviation of one. But it's still, the area under the curve, just like any other normal distribution, the total number of observations is 100%, and so the area is one. But this particular uh, distribution has some unique values. 
and uh, the area again under the curve is one but if we if we look at this distribution and some statisticians have uh, tried to collect slices of this curve instead of trying to use that functional form that I referred to if we take a slices of this curve and cal calculate the area under the curve from left side all the way to the mean that can be put in a table uh, for, for values of the uh, of the x value on the standard normal and that's the normal distribution curve that we can see in any uh, statistics book or uh, in the uh, Excel sheet that I have provided in the course content and so uh, that's uh, then we can refer to these normal values from any other variable of interest and help us to not to have to calculate the area under the curve using in the, an integral of the function I showed before but using values directly from the table and that makes uh, life a lot easier and a lot easier to answer questions and do uh, calculations from the table than uh, rather than from the function. So that transformation from any uh, variable to a, a standard normal we call that a z-score and so that z-score in in terms of transformation form is the variable in other words uh, minus mean divided by a standard deviation in other words we can take any normal distribution and essentially put it over a standard normal and cover that standard normal end to end and here's how to show it pictorially to show to you so let's say that i have a in a, a variable it could be revenue, could be uh, uh, defects, it could be length of some process, and I have that distribution by collecting in, uh, a number of samples and creating a histogram and then fitting a kernel. Well, let's say I have this normal distribution here, so it has a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma. Because it is a, a normal function, I can essentially map this normal distribution over a standard normal as I pointed out in a standard normal we have collected the slices of the area under the curve and put them in a table and I claim that every point on this variable of interest uh, has a corresponding point on the standard normal so the mean corresponds to the mean here is, is zero and one standard deviation correspond to one, two standard deviation correspond to two, and any other value that we're interested in here, let's x, has a corresponding value right on the standard normal. So from any point, uh, if we are collecting the data, which is a really probability or percentages or chance, from this function, and let's say I'm looking at the area under this curve up to this point, the, to, to the point of x, that would be the same percentage of, of a standard normal distribution to this point of z. And so while visually this may not look the same, but uh, from a calculation point of view, the area on the disk curve up to point of z is the same in terms of the uh, uh, fraction of 1 is the same as the area on the disk curve uh, up to this point. And so you can physically think about it. If I can grab the two sides of this curve and squeeze it together oh, sorry let me just squeeze it together and then carry it over and put it over this curve it should fit exactly on on this on this curve and by doing that that's essentially what i'm doing by moving it i'm subtracting mu uh, any value uh, x minus mu in other words i'm moving the mean of a of this distribution to zero that's this this numerical value and then if i divide it in other words rescale it dividing it by the standard deviation i'm creating essentially a distribution with a standard deviation of one and a mean of zero and that exactly fits over the same so the whole point is that then i can answer questions about this distribution about this variable by looking at the data in a normal table by looking at the z-score value and here's how it's done so let's you can look at an example let's say if a person scored 85 on a test 
with a mean value of 50 and a standard deviation of 20. The person scored 1.75 a standard deviation above the mean. In other words, that will be, if you're going back to that previous chart, so an 85 point, uh, uh, an 85, and here it has a corresponding point on the standard normal, and that's how we calculate that transformation. So with the 85, the mean value was 50, so I'm shifting it by 50, so the mean value becomes zero. I'm dividing it by the standard deviation of uh, of the test score, and that's 20. So that on a normal distribution, then it will correspond to 1.75, the standard deviation on the axis of a unit normal. And that, uh, that essentially corresponds to the area under the curve. Uh, and so if we refer that to the z-score, and in this particular case will be 0.9599. In other words, uh, that, uh, that person that scored 85, that's about 95% uh, of that, that distribution. And, nice. and how do we find the, uh, you can go to a, uh, table in any statistical book or if you're looking at the z-score table in here for um, 0.85 when I uh, transferred it to uh, to a z-score it was 1.75 so if I come here on the z-scale and look at 1.7 1, 1. Uh, this is 1.7 and if I go uh, across to 5 that's 0.9599 that is the probability of a person getting uh, 85 on the on the test uh, that we talked about it so this 0.95 is a probability or the chance of getting that value and instead of uh, calculating the these percentages directly from a normal distribution function we just pick up the number or the data directly from a z-score or a normal table which makes the lot the life a lot easier doing it uh, from a table than trying to integrate uh, that functional form. So uh, here's an, let's say another uh, example. Let's say that if the IQ score of adolescent is normally distributed with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15, what percentage of the population will have an IQ score below 85? So here we have 85, uh, the mean value is 100, so if you subtract 100 from 85 divided by 15, we get minus 1. So the probability that the person scores l less than 85 or up to 85, this is a probability that the z value on a standard normal be less than or equal to minus 1. And if you go to the, and that's correspond to this shaded area. So think about this as being the standard normal distribution. And we have minus one in here. And so this area under the curve is the probability of scoring 85. And so that, if you look at it uh, on, on the normal distribution table, or I just show, we're going to show it in the, in the z-score table, that's uh, about 15% or 15.87%. Now, how do we get that data from the uh, table? Well, let me go back to my... So, that uh, was minus 1. Um, this is the positive side of the table. And there's also a negative side of the table. Um, okay, so let me get the... Uh, so if I look at the negative uh, side of the distribution, that was minus 1. And if I come down here to minus 1, that's uh, 0.1587. So that's the probability of a person uh, uh, scoring um, 85 on an IQ test. So that's a, that's a way you, we, we find out those type of probabilities or chances uh, corresponding to the area under the curve from a, a Z-score table or a normal distribution table. So let's go back to the test uh, test example that I had before. Let's go back uh, to that example and say the mean score of the test was 75 and the standard deviation was 15. 
So a question is, um, a student wants to know what is the chance of getting A in that test, or 90 or higher. So the probability of getting X being greater or equal to 90 is equal to probability that the Z be greater or equal to, now we have to calculate the Z transformation, which will be 90 minus 75 divided by 15. So that's the probability of Z being greater than 1. Uh, so since the tables are calculated from left to right, so if you're looking for an area that's greater than a particular value, we need to look at the area that's less than the value and subtract it from 1. So to get the probability of z being greater than 1, we're so to get the area for z greater than 1, we have to subtract that uh, 1 from that area that will be less than 1. So that's 1 minus, now for looking at the z uh, will be equal to 1, that value in the z table is 0.8413. That's the area covering from, all the, from, from the left all the way to the point of z be equal to 1. And so when we subtract that, we get the right-hand side of the distribution as being 0.1587. So the chances of a scoring uh, greater than 90, 90 or greater, will be 16%. That's the chance of a scoring in that test uh, for an A. Uh, now let's look at a different type of, uh, of the same example. So let's say that a student wants to know the chances of uh, getting a B. So if you could don't think you're going to get an A and you want to see whether you can get a B that will be a score between 80 and 90. So the probability that X falls between 80 and 90 is the probability that Z falls between this transformation 80 minus 75 divided by 15 and this transformation which is 90 minus 75 divided by 15 and so that means that the Z will be between 0 0.331 uh, and 1. Oh, and so to get this value, that's kind of a slice between two values of the z. And so we, if you think about collecting the data from left, since I've got two values here, first I need to collect the, or get the data corresponding to the area under the care for the uh, upper point, and then subtract the area under the care for the, for the lower point. So that would be 0.8413 and then we subtract 0 0.6305 from that and we'll get 0 0.2108, which in this case means that the chance of getting a B is 21%. And so you can see that knowing and having the distribution, particularly if it is exactly normal or close to normal, then we can answer this type of question, whether it's a test score or the chance of meeting a schedule, in a, in a project or the amount of resources, uh, you're going to exceed uh, the time and, uh, and, and the resources or staffing. So many of those kind of questions can be easily answered quantitatively if you have the distribution uh, using a, a Z-score table. And uh, by the way, if the distribution doesn't fit, you can still look at this type of uh, uh, areas from a histogram. Uh, table uh, by looking at the two different points and trying to figure out what is the the amount of frequency that covers the slice between those two values. Uh, but using a normal table is, is, is a lot easier to do that. Okay, so with that now we covered the basic statistics and we talk about the skull analysis and use of the score. Let's go and now talk about control charts. A uh, control chart is actually a run chart or a trend chart with control limits. And if you think about here, when we talk about trend charts, you have values that you plot them over time. And so it goes down, goes up, and goes down. Now, if we can calculate the control limits for this trend line and put an upper and lower control limit, then we've got a control chart. And as long as the observation falls within the control limits, then we say the, the process is in control. 
And if a value and observation like this one goes above the control limits, then we say the, the process is out of control because this has gone beyond. Uh, remember, the in, in a normal distribution, the control limits are actually three standard deviation. And when I talk about the standard deviation, we said three standard deviation actually covers 99.7% uh, of, uh, of the area. So when Schuhart invented the control chart, he put that 99.7 as being, the, you know, the limit of a uh, uh, of the output, and so three standard deviation uh, represented essentially all the output uh, at that time. And so, if some data point went far beyond three standard deviation, then something else would have gone wrong with the process, and we then call that uh, that that point uh, of the process be out of control, and we try to look for causes of that. And we call those special ca causes by eliminating the special causes first, and then we can think about how do we can uh, also remove the common causes, which is really what the process variation in inherent uh, to the process is. And uh, if we can reduce that, then the the data points will fall much closer to the to the mean, and they will not have as much uh, as much variation. And that could be a, a quality improvement because variation often cause problems in terms of the output. So pictorially here, let's say that we have a, a process and we have uh, calculated these control limits uh, of here and here. And as we make observation as time goes on, and let's assume that somebody was uh, producing a gadget. And from earlier sample, we identified what was the control limits for that process. And now we are looking at the new output or new samples. And oh, a point goes outside the control limits. And we say, this, and now this process is out of control. We try to find out what has caused that, uh, uh, that out of control issue. And could be something external to the process. We identify that. And if you eliminate that, then the process gets back to uh, to its its normal variation or within the uh, within the control limits. Now, if we make f further improvement to the process, uh, trying to reduce, and we talk about six sigma, for example, later on, by trying to reduce the variation. Once we reduce the variation and collect a new sample, we can then create a new control limit, which will be sh showing much narrower level. So, if this was three standard deviation from our uh, older process, the new three standard deviation will fall much shorter. And we expect that if the process is a control, then all the points will randomly be distributed around the mean within these new control limits. Now, there are many different control charts and uh, for, for both variables and uh, attributes. Uh, but one of the, let me say, the two common type of control chart. One is that if your process is actually normally distributed, uh, the way Schuhart defined it, uh, control limits for, for that process is 3 standard deviation above the mean and 3 standard deviation below the mean. But not every process is normal, or we may not be able to show that it's normal. So if the process is not normal, a statistician has shown that if we collect samples of data, the average of the samples and the range of the samples are normally distributed. And so we always in control chart, we're looking for that 3 standard deviation, whatever the underlying distribution would be. So in this case, we call this X bar and R chart. This is uh, when we don't know that the underlying distribution is normal and we have got a variable. So we can now plot an X bar and R chart. And both of these distribution are statistically normal. And so we can calculate the control limits for them and together look at them and say whether or not the underlying process is, is in control or do we have an issue. So for this chart, you're going to need to either collect samples of data or if you have a longer sample, divide that sample into uh, equal uh, division of observation where each of the samples will be at least uh, five 
uh, items or, or five observations or more. Then we get the, this group of, of, of the samples together and then we try to calculate the control limit. So let me show you that by an example. So in this case, let's say that the following data tracks the production hours for a, for a machine per day over a 10 week period. So I've got 10 weeks and each week I've got samples of data. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So it's a five observation, five items of observation, and so uh, this one, um, the output, let's say, is four, three, four, four, five. So I've got five samples. Now, if I get the average of of these samples, so if I add them all together and then divide them by five, I get x bar as being four, and then I look for the range of the sample, the maximum number minus the uh, smallest number. So that would be 5 minus 3, that's 2. So for the second week when I collect the samples, I've got 3, 3, 3, 3, 3 4, uh, and so the average here is 3.2, the range is 1, uh, and then the, the third week and fourth week and so forth all the way to the tenth week. So I've got two columns of data. I've got the average of, the, of those five samples per week and the range of the five samples per week. And so these two columns of data then are normally distributed but to uh, to calculate the uh, control values for those three standard deviation the uh, the calculation is a little bit more complicated than just getting a standard deviation of, uh, of the numbers what we use here are uh, for the X bar was the average of the of the samples and R was the uh, the range of the uh, of, of those those samples I've got an R bar is the average of the R's. So in the previous examples, the uh, the the range the total number of uh, value of the range was 17. If I divide by 10, so my uh, mean of the ranges is 1.7. And if I get the mean of the x, you know, each of the observation was x bar. That was an average of the five days. So if I now average over the 10 week, I get x double bar. And that's uh, uh, that's the average of all the x bars. So I would calculate this and then um, go to the formula that we need to use in order to get those control limits. So for R chart, which really represents the variation uh, of uh, of the dispersion, uh, the upper control limit is d4 times R bar. Now these um, D A2, D3, and D4, uh, these are statistically calculated and it's a function of how many observation I have in the group. I said the best thing is to have at least five. So if you have two or three or four or five all the way to ten, then uh, you can look at these values. These are standard. It's in any um, statistical book. And so at, uh, at sample size being five, then uh, A2 is 0.85, A, D3 is 0, and D4 is 2.11. So for for the upper control limit of the R chart, I need to multiply D4 by the average of R. So that's from this table is 2.11. If I multiply by 1.7, which was average of R, then the upper control limit for R is 3.6. For the lower control limit is D3 times R bar. But D3 tends to be zero till your sample you know, within each group it gets to more than uh, more than six to get to seven. Then you start having some values. So since D3 is zero, times 1.7 is zero. For the X bar, which represents the variation of the mean, the upper control limit is X double bar plus A2 times R bar. So that's the uh, average of uh, of the means is 3.7 then uh, plus a2 from this table for the size of 5 is 0.58 times uh, r bar 1.7 that's 4.7 this uh, upper control limit and if we subtract it from x double bar it's 2.7 is the lower control limit so now i've got my control limits then i can plot my charts for the r chart i've got the upper control limit and the lower control limit uh, 
And here what I'm plotting is really the range values. That I, for each week I got a range value. So this first week, the second week, third week, all the 10 weeks. So I'm plotting them and uh, these data all uh, falling within the control limits. For the X bar chart, I'm doing the same thing. I just calculated the control limits. And then I have got the X bars that I'm plotting for the first week, second week, third week, and so forth. Now here, I've got a couple of points that are touching the control limits. And that's kind of a cause uh, concern for what's going on that I'm not within the control limits. And uh, there may be some uh, special causes associated with that we need to investigate. Now, since I've made these numbers, they're really not following any 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 good process so you could if you look at this you could say well there are three points that are really kind of connected to it so these are not doesn't look like randomly distributed and so there may be an issue uh, but if the if the process was really under control and only varied with the inherent variation of the process then you expect these these data points to be randomly distributed around the mean the same thing in here and as long as the two charts are with within control, then we say the whole process, the underlying process, that production process, is under uh, under control. Uh, but if the R chart is out of control, or the X bar chart is out of control, or both of them are out of control, then the underlying process is out of control. It's possible that the R chart be in control and uh, X bar chart be out of control or vice versa. So when you're doing an X bar and R chart, you're going to need to look at both of the charts together to draw observation or conclusion whether the process is in control and stable or is it causing, it is being affected by some external causes. Now, one of the other uh, control charts that are uh, uh, commonly used is IN and MR chart. Now, well, IN and MR means it's uh, individual uh, points. In the other control chart that, that I pointed out earlier in an X and R, we had group of observation. Now, if I have uh, uh, observation here, I've got a whole series of observation. Um, if I take each of these observation individually, then I can create an I chart and then MR chart this means moving range. Moving range means that I'm subtracting the, the next uh, observation from the previous one and record that uh, as, as the range. So let me just show you how it is done. So I've got these observations uh, uh, data set. First of all, you can uh, calculate the mean of the whole data, and that will be the mean value uh, in here. It will be 9.84. Uh, and then I'm going to show you how to calculate control limits for that mean. But in terms of the range, we're going to take the first one and then subtract the second value from it. Second value is 9. From 10, that gives me a moving range of 1. And if I take the third value and subtract it from 9, and don't worry about the uh, uh, negative sign here, that will be a, a range of 3. Uh, 14 and 12 gives me 2. Of 8 and 14 give me 6 and so I calculate this moving range by subtracting each number from next number or the uh, next number from the previous number and so I'm getting a, a list of ranges and I can um, get the average of the of the ranges so now again just like an X bar we have a, a, a set of uh, values that we're using so in the INMR chart we're using an E value and a D4 value. Uh, since this is a, a single observation uh, or individual observation, the size of the group in this case is 1, uh, and so E2, which is a statistical factor, is 2.66, and D4, just like previously, its, uh, is a, its value at this point is 3.268. Uh, and so to get the upper control limit, uh, again, for the for the R chart, which represents the mean, it will be X bar plus E times the mean of range. It's very similar to the X bar chart. You add, the, you multiply, add them together, you get an upper control limit. And for the lower control limit, we just subtract the E two times the uh, average of uh, moving range uh, value, and that, uh, in this case, become um, zero. Uh, 
uh, because uh, this value could actually be negative and if it is negative we always put the lower control limit of a control chart that's calculated as negative value to, to zero and for the uh, uh, for the MR chart the upper control limit uh, is D4 times average of, uh, of the range and that become 14.64 uh, uh, and the lower limit is D3 uh, times MR bar uh, and that uh, will be uh, uh, also zero so uh, in this case D, D3 was zero uh, and so the lower control limits uh, become zero and uh, then again we plot the control chart i've got the upper control limit lower control limit the same thing for the moving range upper control limit lower control limit and as i pointed out any time that the value of lower control limit end up being negative we put it at zero because negative control limit has no uh, physical meaning and then uh, we are plotting here the actual observation for our chart uh, those are the actual individual observation we're plotting and looking at it to see whether there is any point out of control and we do the same thing for the moving range so I've got these range values that I have plotted uh, again uh, this, this chart a little bit um, may not look very uh, <coughs> very common uh, process because uh, I've made those are the data points and so we get but uh, even within that I've got a point that's touching the lower control limit in here and I've got a point that's touching the upper control limit here and those are points probably to be uh, investigated from the process perspective so that's a little bit about the uh, X bar and R chart uh, or I and MAR chart uh, as part of a control chart for variables one of the important issues that we deal with is the process capability process capability is uh, fundamentally means that uh, is our process capable to produce good output now how do we calculate the process capability for any product or service or whatever we deliver into our customer there is some quality requirement um, the design for a product or gadget uh, requires that for example uh, some values tolerances to be within some specific values uh, or if, uh, if we have some delivery to a customer, the customer may have some uh, specific requirement relative to uh, to that deliverable. Those are specifications. So if we have our specification limits, there is an upper specification limit, lower specification limit, which said uh, kind of tell us how much uh, variation the the customer or the design can tolerate and still be good. Now. If we divide that by six standard deviation, three on each side, as we talk about uh, standard deviation in control chart, this process shows that the six standard deviation variation within the specification limit, that represents our capability index. And we're looking to see whether this ratio is greater than one or smaller than one. If the ratio is greater than one, means that uh, that the specification limit is wider than six standard deviation in that case the output tend to be good all the time if the cp or index is less than one if you think about and looking at this uh, this uh, ratio in here if this ratio is less than one that means that the um, numerator this tolerance value either by design or by customer is smaller than three standard deviation on each side of the mean which means there are going to be some process output that's going to fall outside the specification limit and so in that case the process is not capable to produce good output all the time that's the notion of the process capability and so a specification limit has really nothing to do with the process this is our requirement on the process the process variation is defined by that six standard deviation. So if the specification limit gives us a wider tolerance, then the process variation, we get good output all the time. If it is less than six standard deviation, then our output at times is going to be unacceptable. In practice, uh, the industry uses a ratio of 1.25 for a 
a good capable process and I'm going to show you the reason for why we picking a value greater than one so pictorially uh, think about this is our upper specification limit lower specification limit and if this is our process six standard deviation three standard deviation on each side in this case the specification limit is wider than six sigma which means this process is capable if you look at it pictorially all of my observations are within the specification limit so they are good they are acceptable either by design or by customer if on the other hand cp is right on one here i've got my upper specification and lower specification right uh, at the end of this distribution and if this is normal three standard deviation on each side remember if you go back to some of the earlier side is 99.7 so there is a little bit of a our observation that could fall on over here and and some that could fall over here and not be acceptable so to eliminate that in practice the industry looks for a, a cp equal to 1.25 which is kind of a get the uh this is uh, distribution relative to the six sigma much kind of a tighter a little bit more so the all the output falls within the specification limit and if the specification limit is actually less than uh, six sigma you could see here by observation that some of this output on this side and on this side are outside the specification limit so these outputs are not acceptable if it is by design if you're designing a product it could be the thought it is not meeting the tolerance so it, it doesn't work or it cannot be used and if it is a customer requirement again the same thing we cannot ship a product that does not meet customer requirements uh, if you fall on this side or in this side of the distribution Now, what I showed you before as upper specification limit minus lower specification limit divided by six sigma, that's true when the process and the and the tolerance are centered on each other. In other words, so from the mean of the process or the center of the uh, specification limit, both are on on each other. So we have we have got a, a, at least the same uh, symmetrical value on on both sides but that's not always true in design or in requirement uh, in for example in design the tolerance on the uh, upper side could be larger than the tolerance or lower side or or vice versa so if the uh, process and the specification uh, are not centered then i've got to look at two uh, two uh, capability index one on the lower uh, on the upper side and so here i've got upper specification limit minus mu but since i'm looking at one side of the distribution then i'm dividing it by three sigma and so this is one capability on the upper side of the distribution and this is the other capability when we're looking mu minus lower specification again divided by three sigma and i'm going to look at each of these separately to see which one is smaller the smaller one represents our process capability so let's say that on this example uh, i have a, a process that's centered here on, on on the value of 20 my upper specification limit is 22 my lower specification limit is 16 and the sigma of the process is 0.8 so if i take upper specification limit which is uh, 22 minus mean divided by 3 sigma 3 times 0.8 is 2.4 and taking the uh, mean minus the lower specification limit divided by 3 sigma i'm getting two value 0.83 and 1.67 so this lower uh, this capability toward the upper specification limit is less than one so this process is not capable and if you look at the picture you could see that on the lower end the distribution is finishes here my specification limit is is over here and so all the observation on this side are acceptable 1.67 capability but on the other upper uh, portion the specification limit is only acceptable up to this point the variation from the mean is acceptable only up to this point but my process can produce output that goes all the way uh, up to here and so there's this portion here that's not acceptable and that means that the whole process 
is not as capable. So in this case, we take 0.83 as being the capability index. Again, if the process, however, was centered on the specification limit or the specification limit was centered on the process, then CP would have been equal to CPK and we would have taken 22 minus 16 divided by 6 sigma and that would give us a capability of 1.25. But that's, that's not the way this process is is designed or it's working and so this process is not capable. So in summary uh, I reviewed the basic statistics, um, talk a little bit about the histogram and distribution and how we use the histogram uh, to really get to the functional uh, form of the distribution and we like in most cases to be uh, normal. Uh, we, we talk about the uh, properties of the standard normal that the mean and and uh, mode uh, are, are on the same and uh, and we use the c score to make a transformation between any uh, variable that has normal uh, property with a unit normal or a standard normal and then we can use the z score table to infer or refer to the standard normal for calculating chances and, and probabilities and show how to create a control chart for variables and discuss the process uh, capability. So with that, uh, thank you for watching. Uh, I will come back uh, next and talk about control variable for attributes.